How you doing? I'm Mike Gaddy and welcome to the 743 Patterson Park Podcast. There are three major things that make up my DNA. My creativity, my love of travel, and being a gay man. In the first several episodes of this podcast, we really did a pretty good job of exploring creativity and especially as it relates to Baltimore and the COVID-19 pandemic. And we will get back to that. In the second part of this podcast, We had an ongoing discussion about food and even where to drink and places to go. We virtually traveled around our neighborhood, which was the best we could do during COVID-19 to bring you the best eats and the best drinks and the best local merchants. And we will get back to that. But I haven't done a very good job on my own podcast of talking as an LGBTQ activist, as talking to you as a gay man. And... When the Black Lives Matter protests happened in the summer, I really began to realize the similarities between the Black Lives Matter movement and their struggle and their advocacy and what I had gone through when I was younger, marching on the streets of New York and Baltimore and Washington as a member of ACT UP. Our slogan, silence equals death, was to protest the Reagan administration's silence. So this was a while ago. It took the Black Lives Matter movement and watching them hit the streets and protest against George Floyd and everything else that was going on, Breonna Taylor, to really bring the similarities and the struggle home to me. And then the Atlanta shootings hit. And I started to realize when the when the AAPI community hit the streets, the similarities that existed between the LGBTQ movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, and oh my God, the AAPI movement. So I wanted to talk to somebody who would bring an AAPI perspective to the podcast. And luckily I had already talked to somebody who was very eloquent um, about social matters and food here in Baltimore. And that was the food nomad, Leandro, on Instagram. He has thousands of followers, and his is a mashup on Instagram between food commentary and social commentary. But when the Atlanta shootings hit, I really wanted his perspective on what it meant to be Asian American Pacific Islander in the United States right now during the pandemic. And I really realized that the commonality that that exists between our communities wasn't just imagined in my mind, but was actually obvious and stark. So please sit back and take a listen. I, I, I really wanted to talk to you because you have such a keen cutting um commentary that's unlike anything else I've seen. So I guess one of the things you talk a lot about is silence being complicity. You, you, you say it in several of your blogs, silence is complicity, silence is the problem, etc. And it throws right back to me the silence equals death mantra of the gay activists in the 1980s with Ronald Reagan. So it's a kind of... What's your feeling on that? Why do you think it's so important for people to be the opposite of silent right now with what's going on? I think like if you are going to enjoy our cultures, if you're going to enjoy our food, if you're going to do those kind of things, then you need to speak up when things happen, when there's hate and when there is racism, when there's sexism, there's misogyny. You know, Atlanta was a full gambit of all of that. There were stereo. There are racist tropes, there is misogyny, there are uh, just assumptions based on whatever that were all rooted in white supremacy and racism. Um, and I know those words could be uncomfortable with people who just use social media as an outlet. But again, we've talked before that food is political, everything is intertwined. And if you are going to support our food, then you should recognize as human beings and when things happen to our community, you not speaking up is just as harmful as what is happening and going on because you're going along with this violence and this hate. And to not speak up, I think to me is a crime in itself. Sorry for the harsh words. 
you said this has been going on since at least two Decembers ago with the advent of COVID, but right. I, you know, it, it actually, you have been, you meaning the AAPI community, not you personally, <laughs> you as the AAPI community and ha has been struggling since World War II. Where, I mean, you know, right. Jack, they were putting people in, at Fort Meade in internment camps during World War II of Japanese American descent. So let me let me clarify. Like that, this this recent spate of uh, anti API violence began two December ago. Right. I think like there's a lot of people where it came into their consciousness because of Atlanta and maybe the past couple of months. But we have been talking about it and the increase of it since two December ago. And like you know, a lot of people mention the Chinese Exclusion Act. They mentioned internment camps. They mentioned redlining, they mentioned various massacres against the AAPI community in the United States. But what people fail to mention is none of these are surprises because the United States has been literally waging war on the Asian continent for probably 75 years now. And they have been used to killing the AAPI community as a government for 75 years now. So anything like that kind of translates over here that seems discriminatory, I think is just part and parcel of what the United States is, right? Like we are only good as a community if we provide a service for you. Otherwise we are a threat. And you know, that service could be anything like the mild minority myth where it was created by a white supremacist to put a wedge between us and the black community to show us as like, you know, the, the minority that, and I hate that word, by the way, um, the community of color that can exist and go along, get along and be successful in this country and held up as an example. But, you know, a lot of people don't know that that is complete garbage and a complete myth. And like the poverty gap in the Asian American community is wider than any other community, um, any community of color in the United States. You know, we are certainly not a wedge and we certainly aren't a model minority to be used by white supremacists. And by no means do we say that our, that there is no, there's no hierarchy of wrongs. Like we're not better than Black Lives Matter, the LGBTQ movement or anything like that. We're saying that there's room for all of it and it's all essentially the same, right? Yeah, it they yeah. all seem to parallel the same, whether you're talking about the 80s. I mean, we're talking, what, 40 years ago now, silence equals right. act up. And here you are writing to 2021, just a few days ago, silence is no longer an option. I, you know, those parallels right. are dramatic. Um, and I mean, one of the biggest differences is that, um, like any community, the Asian community is not a monolith, but especially for us, we all come from different countries. The Philippines is drastically different from say China or Korea, especially in terms of colonization and occupation. Um, so the Asian community is, a, is, is probably a little bit more fractured, but also we have a history of coming here. And you know, most of our parents and we are, are still a relatively young community, um, exclusive of the Chinese who've been here for hundreds of years, but there's a lot of Southeast Asian immigrants who are either first gen or second gen, who, whose parents immigrated from here. I've been taught a lot of times that, you know, maybe as a defense mechanism or maybe as something else, like, just, you know, keep your head down, work hard. You're not going to change anything. So why speak up, right? Like just build yourself a good life and go forward. But, you know, seeing that if we followed all the rules and we did everything that we needed to do to be successful in this country and seeing that it still doesn't matter, means that we have a rude awakening in front of us where we can no longer be silent. And I am so proud to be an Asian in this moment in a silver lining where there are so many Asian voices speaking up right now, new ones, old ones, but they are all, you know, talking about nuance and complexity and how we relate with other communities of color, how we relate to white supremacy, and they're not being silent. So, you know, that is one of the better things, quote unquote, to come out of this. But yeah, we, we have no choice but to speak up at this point. One of the things you talk eloquently about 
is feeling even excluded to some extent from the a yourself from the API community because you for a while felt like you couldn't embrace it. People didn't see you as being Asian enough. Uh, and right. So, it, so what was that like growing up? Because you were first gen, right? I am an immigrant, but um, commonly known as a one point fiber because, um, which is in itself not a great term, but like I was born there, but I moved here young enough where I don't remember a lot of the Philippines. So. Um, it's weird because like, uh, you know, I love my parents to death and I fully respect the choices that they made. But like when you come to the country as an immigrant, all you really want to do is kind of fit in. It's kind of an assimilation model per se. So my parents spoke to me in English uh, and I lost the language, you know, and, and in Toronto, we grew up with a large Filipino community. But when we moved to, to the States, there really wasn't one. So like my peers and my friends were, were all white for the most part, actually for all the parts, they're all white. So growing up like that is you, you lose a bit of your Asian-ness and you lose a bit of a, like I was just thinking about it and I love my high school friends to death, but I was only one, I'm not gonna share it, I was only one with a nickname that had nothing to do with my name. You know, they, they picked a character from uh, a shock jock show and stuff like that, but everyone else's nicknames were like, a play on James, if your name's James, your nickname's Jimmy and stuff like that. But my nickname was always different. And no one could say my name in high school, which is these days mind blowing because it's first of all, phonetic. And actually that's it, it's phonetic. So like, if you can't say it, you're kind of lazy, but th those are the kind of microaggressions you grow up that you kind of accept because you're like, oh, that's just funny, you know, and you're living in a white world, but then when you counter like other Filipinos who speak the language, who go back to the homeland uh, once a year, you know, things like that, you start feeling like you're not quite Filipino because you didn't quite grow up like that. And I think what the story is, is the Asian American experience is expansive, not reductive. And I think there are so many experiences, like uh, I went to the vigil on Monday and there were uh, a lot of mixed race stations there who had the same feelings of not being Asian enough or not being black enough or not being white enough because they're mixed. There are good, there are stories out there right now about Asian adoptees who don't feel Asian enough are desperately trying to connect their Asian roots but they're being shunned by the community because they are adopted here and they don't know, you know, essentially where to start in the beginning. And so they're just finding themselves out. I think all that is part of the Asian American experience and don't ever let anyone gatekeep you and tell you you're not Filipino enough or you're not Asian enough or anything like that because we're all contributing to our continuing story. So in Baltimore and the surrounding area, uh, Baltimore County and Howard County have the highest proportion of Asian American AAPI community in the state. Why do you think that is? Why do you think uh, in a lot of other cities, you know, there's Chinatown, there's there's definite places where the API community congregate and live and thrive, but here it seems scattered into the burbs. And I'm just wondering why, from a Baltimore experience, you think that that that's the case. So Baltimore actually had a thriving Chinatown for a long time, and it kind of fizzled out in the 70s, I believe. Um, it fizzled out twice and it was resurrected twice. Um, I help out with a group called Charm City Night Market. We actually put on a festival for two years in a row in old Chinatown. Um, I do not know the intricacies of why communities have moved out of Baltimore. Uh, I know there's a large Korean population where I live in Ellicott City. And I think, you know, once Koreans started moving out there, they just kind of, you know, followed and, and established community here where they um, could have, a, you know, a, a critical mass of their own community. And I know there are a lot of Filipinos up in Towson um, that have moved up there and over the past, you know, two or three decades. So I think, you know, for a lot of immigrant communities, they go where they see other immigrants and it just kind of build up. But even in Ellicott City where you live, um this latest spout of anti-AAPI violence has touched home. Uh, the Baltimore Sun interviewed one restaurant owner 
Jennifer, is it Qui? Am I pronouncing that right? Q-I-U? Came in just this month, March, the like the a little bit before Mar March 18th, because the story was on March 18th. Accosted one of her Asian uh, customers, cursing and shouting that the customer had coronavirus to the point where police had to be called and he was hauled away in a disorderly conduct charge. You have friends in New York City who are Asian and they are freaking out on a daily basis about walking the streets there. They are scared for their lives and for the violence that occurs. And, you know, you, you kind of think, well, do you think it'll happen to you? But like, it just, it's, it's just happening more frequently. And the Atlanta, while Atlanta was a culmination of what the worst could happen, it still continues despite of like national news and national media attention and, you know, Atlanta, it was two weeks ago and we had another major shooting a week later. So it's kind of fading in people's memories, but, you know, hate and racism apparently isn't. So I came across an article about the Baltimore blast owner getting in trouble this past year. I don't remember what month it is uh, for selling T-shirts with a red outline of China and, you know, crossed out. Yep. Does the average person see this, you know, as kind of okay? I mean, I think that's two questions, but, and also two of my colleagues from the Chinatown Collective and Charm City Night Market were quoted in that article, criticizing the blast owner who happens to be like own first Mariner bank or something. And like it's a pretty big shot in Baltimore. And he doubled down on the comments saying that's absolutely what, what that means. But, you know, at the end of the day, he doesn't get to decide that. Right, it's the aggrieved communities that do get to decide that. Um, an expert by any means, but I feel like we are a little behind in, in people recognizing this. And I think like a lot of the narratives now, and, it's, and I've written a little bit about it, is that you know it, people are having a hard time figuring out how to support our community because while it is the same cause as everything else, this is a little different, right? Like we are essentially asking you to recognize our humanity and. You know, like if you want to support, great, make a donation, support Asian businesses, but don't stop there. And I, I and I am irritated and angry at the the local magazines like the Washingtonian and Baltimore magazine who are like, here's how you can support the Asian community. And essentially it is go see this artwork, go eat this food, go watch this webinar. Oh, maybe make a donation, right? That is still a transaction that benefits the white person somehow, consuming art, consuming food, consuming etc. And we just want you, the way you can support us most and best is to recognize that we're humans and we don't have to produce anything for you. And it, it's, it's really like a discussion of like, we're trying to explain to you that we exist and you're saying to us, oh, dumplings are delicious. I'll buy more of those and I've done my part. It begins with the idea that our cultures only exist for the consumption of the majority, whether it is through our artistic endeavors, the fetishization of Asian women, or even eating and appropriating our food. I think I let off with that quote. It's one of my favorite that you have, but it's exactly what you just said. Yeah. I mean, it is so evident that, you know, if you could talk to us as humans is really what we're asking for. Uh, I am grateful for everyone who has checked in on me during this you know, past couple of weeks, uh, almost guilty about it, but like, you know, there are a lot of like racist tropes about whether or not, for example, whether or not these women who were murdered in Atlanta were sex workers or not. It doesn't matter if they were sex workers. Right. Um, first, well, we have to de again, the idea. Again, the gay community, that is their favorite way of of saying somehow it's okay for this hate crime to exist. Oh, well, he was cruising the park. Oh, well, he was doing this. Oh, well, he was right. in, you know, in the meat packing district looking for meat, whatever. Immediately then that makes it okay for that person to have been gay bashed. And what you're saying is the same right. thing is happening here saying, oh, well, she was a sex worker. Therefore, you know, it's okay. Well, I don't know if it's proven there were sex workers. No, it wasn't. But, um, like there's two things that need to happen. First, we have to destigmatize sex work. It's valid work. Um, the second thing though is much more insidious because it's a racist trope that just because these women worked in a nail salon or a massage parlor or 
anything. It's assumed they were sex workers. So they were, they had sex work adjacency because of racism. So they still suffered the stigma that you mentioned about sex work and that, that needs to go away. But when these women were first killed, that's not what I thought when I first, when they first killed, I thought that they were my titas, you know, and I wrote about that there. I, I thought for sure these were my titas who got murdered and they would never come home again and see their children or talk about them. I, I, you know, I couldn't give a fuck about what kind of work they did. I was just concerned like on a human level that they're never going to see their children again. Tita means aunt, am I right? Yes, in yes. Tagalog. Uh, you, you write in one of your more passionate postings a few days ago or maybe a couple weeks ago. My tea, do you mind if I share this? About your yeah, tea? absolutely. Okay. It's, yeah, it's on yeah, my account. On Instagram. My Tita Ada, Ada, is that right? Ada. Ada in Toronto died a couple months ago. Long-term complications, virtual funerals are surreal. It's, I've only told one person outside of my family until today because I've been thinking about her a lot lately. She was my first and primary babysitter when we first immigrated from the uh, Philippines. She was kind, generous, and so, so patient with me. I miss her very much. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. Like many Filipinos, she wasn't a blood relative, but she was definite family. Skipping ahead again. The story isn't unique to immigrants. And when you hear other Asians say they knew the women in Atlanta, It's because they did. We all had a Tita Ada. So I, I think that brings home to, to people how, how tight knit this community is and how like the black community, it relies on extended family and support and all that kind of thing. And I just, I, I think it's probably the, the single post that kind of drove home to me how you saw these shootings versus how the average white person saw these shootings. Am I reading more into that than there is, or am I right? I mean, I can't speak for the average white person, but it's definitely how I saw these shootings. I kind of cut the video off rather abruptly at the end because Leandro began to choke up. I began to choke up and well, I didn't, want to get, I didn't want to get sloppy. But we all have an Aunt Ida. We all have people who teach us and mentor us and help us through the way, who we learn from, who are more than just friends, but who are actually part of who helps raise us. And obviously, when those women were killed in Atlanta, in the Filipino community, in the AAPI community, it was like their own Aunt Ida's were killed that day simply for being who they were. Just like when George Floyd was forced onto the ground with his hands cuffed behind his back as we're rehearing in emotional detail during the current trial and a police officer knelt on his neck for more than nine minutes, almost 10 minutes, it tore at the fabric of that community. Or when a gay kid was lashed to a fence post and left to die in the middle of, the, of a farm field, which caused me to become the activist that I was in my, well, in my earlier years, it tore at the fabric of that community. Next week, Leandro and I will continue our discussion. We'll talk about the AAPI community and the continuing threat of violence and discrimination. But we'll also talk about the Baltimore food scene and places to eat and dine. Hope you have a great week. Happier times are ahead. The pandemic is finally ending, God willing, given the vaccines going into people's arms. Please have a great week. We'll talk to you soon.